my name is Mary Garish and I'm a landscape painter. And today we're going to explore the topic of tonalism. When I first started painting, I was drawn to color first before everything else. And I have to say a lot of color. Maybe that stems from my last name Garish, but uh, since then my aesthetic taste has changed and I've become much more attracted to tonal paintings, both for their simplicity and close value. So today we're going to explore this topic. Okay, so now we're going to proceed to the sketchbook and I'm going to show you how I studied to come up with my design. So our references here that you can see, there are three moonlit photos and I am no photographer. Uh, this was just taken with my iPhone from my front yard and actually my backyard. And so I used these to come up with interesting lines and interesting shapes, which pine trees are great because they're just so varied and uh, so many great distinctive branches and everything. So I drew a square here, a two by two, and I decided like where my lines were gonna go. So I thought that I might like to have a tree line on the third and then the sky backlighting a couple of interestingly designed pine trees. So I did this one and then I came back in and did another one that's similar but varied as to the shapes and everything. And then I moved down to a vertical. I thought, well, maybe I wanna emphasize the verticality of the pine trees. So this is a two by two and a half. And I placed my lines here, very simple lines. You can do these very rapidly. And then I came over here and kind of refined them a little bit more. And then I have another one down here. So you need to do multiple thumbnails with the pencil to really, you know, expand your thoughts on where you want the painting to go. So I decided I really liked the square painting, but I wasn't sure. And so the next step, I went and I started studying value with my three markers here. These are Prismacolor markers, and you can get them on Amazon. They come like a pack of 12, and they go all the way from zero to 10, um, zero being white. Uh, I should say zero to 100. Uh, so there's 10%, 20%, 30%, each progressively getting darker. So I'm gonna try to keep this painting to a three value painting. So I have three values here. I have 20%, I have 50%, and I have 80%. So the sky will be my lightest value. And since this is going to be a nocturne and a tonal painting, my upright trees, that form is going to be my darkest dark. So the mid-tone is going to be the reflection of those into the water. So I started with my markers and designing on the square. And then I went to the vertical. And I still wasn't 100% certain, even doing my value studies, which one I liked the best. On this study, I thought the trees were too central, but that's an easy fix. And I thought there were too many branches. So you're really working out a lot of things in your sketchbook. I tried a horizontal, and I really didn't like that. So ultimately, I decided I liked the square better. Uh, I thought it was more intimate, and I think that that's where I'm going to take my painting when we go to the easel. That's it. Okay, so now I want to show you what tools I'm going to use to make this painting today. So much in the way of the tonalist movement, I am going to use a limited palette. And as you can see here on my palette, I have cadmium lemon, I have yellow ochre, so I have two yellows. The ochre, of course, being a muted tone, which means a neutral. So that will help to keep me from getting too garish. And then I have Venetian red, which again is a muted red, and cobalt. I've chosen cobalt because I tend to paint too darkly, and if I use ultramarine, which is much darker than cobalt, I tend to get way too dark. And if I just use the cobalt, I stay in the safe zone. Then I have squirted out 
two colors called cedar and another one is jasper. These are both muted grayed green colors. They come from the Christensen grays by Vasari and I'm using those as convenience colors because they'll help me paint quicker. Now those are made from the three primaries so they really don't count as another color because I could mix those myself. And then I have ruby violet, which is a cool red that I'm going to use. And I have my white. I have some wax that I'm going to use at some point to help get texture. I'm using Neo McGilp as my medium to have the paint flow a little bit better. And I have a Gamsol in here, which is an odorless mineral spirits. I have my trusty palette knife that I like to use for mixing paint and I have different brushes. Brushes are something that I think you need to find on your own, what works for you. When I first started painting, I would just kind of pick up a brush and I wasn't paying attention to what the brush could do for me. So I would suggest just taking a blank canvas and just playing around with some brushes and you know, dig into your paint and seeing how it goes on to the canvas and figuring out for yourself what is the best brush for you. And then I have an old room key from a hotel that sometimes I use to scrape down. One last thing, this is my handy hand and brush cleaner. It's called Marvelous Mary Ann's Savvy Soap. And it's great for your hands, but it is fantastic for your brushes. And what you do is you clean your brush and your turpentine, then you squirt a little bit of this out on the paper towel, and you take your brush and rub it back and forth, and then you squeeze it out, and you'd be surprised how much more paint is left on the paintbrush. And then you leave a little bit on there, and you can condition the tip and make it nice and sharp again. And that's what we'll be using today. Okay, so now I want to show you how I found my palette for the nocturne that I'm going to do today. So first I started experimenting with ochre, transparent red oxide, cadmium orange, and ultramarine. And when I'm doing these little studies, I knew I wanted a square, so it's a square study. I'm not really taking that much care about my shapes because this isn't the study of my shapes. Right here, I'm trying to find my palette and what value structure I want. So this was the first study I did, and I didn't really like it all that much. I went on to the next value study, and I was starting to like this a little bit more. It's Indian yellow, Venetian red, cobalt, and phthalo. But in the end, I didn't really like the phthalo in there, and I thought, you know, I'm going to try one more palette and see where we can go. Okay, so this palette that I used is lemon yellow, ochre, Venetian red, cobalt, and two neutrals that are green from the Christensen Grays by Vasari. Again, it, this is not about shape. It really is all about value and color palette. So I decided on this color palette because I wanted a tonal nocturne. I didn't want it to be so much about color, and the other two palettes that I was using, color got too much in the way. So this is going to be about subtle color shifts and simplified values. And that's why I like this palette. So now we're going to go into a wash-in with my painting. And I hope you enjoy. OK, so now we're going to start with the wash-in. Now, based on my previous line drawings in my sketchbook, I know more or less where I want my lines. So I want to take great care to make sure that I get them in the right place because I spent a lot of time figuring out where I wanted my major masses. So the first thing I'm going to start with is my horizon line. And you always want to make sure that your horizon line is level. That's very important. It's very easy, especially when you're right on top of the canvas, to have just the ever so slightest tilt to it. And that's just a really hard thing later on to fix. And so it's better to fix it on the front end. So that's the first line I'm going to put in. And I know it's uh, right above. I have one third line drawn, drawn in here. And that's like the golden rule lines. And so that's going to help me in my design. Because this design is kind of uh, my major tree mass is going to be just about a third of it. And then two thirds open sky with interesting tree shapes in it. So that's how I have designed it in my head. 
So now I'm going to put the horizon line in. And it was just about an inch above the one-third line. So now the next most interesting line I'm going to just kind of briefly put in is where my diva, which is the moon, where that is going to be. And I know that's about six and a half inches down and about six and a half inches. So, you know, midline would be eight. And so our diva is going to go right around in here. So I'm just putting in some little placement lines, nothing too interesting. And so this is going to be our tree line. And it is somewhat of a vertical line. But it should be an interesting broken up vertical line. Uh, this is one where one of the uh, tree masses is going to be. So I'm just putting a line in here and another tree that's going to come over in here in our design. And then I have the marsh plains that are kind of layered in here. And I know this one's about four down from the bottom, so I'm going to draw that in. And that one's about an inch and a half from the other one. Okay, so those are our major lines that I'm going to draw in. I think that will give me enough of a reference point that when I'm doing a wash in, it will guide me. So now, most of the time when I do a wash in, a lot of times it's transparent. But this time, I'm not going to do a transparent wash in. I'm going to be working more on shape finding. And so I'm going to mix up kind of a neutral tone for all the land masses. It will be my mid-tone, and then on top of that, I will put other mid-tones because I will bend this one warmer, cooler, redder, bluer, and then I will lay my darks in on top of that. Since my mid-tone is about 60% of the painting, that's why I'm going to start with that. Okay, so now I'm going to start mixing, and I'm going to take this grade neutral green which is called cedar, and I'm going to neutralize it and darken it a little bit with the ruby red violet to kind of get a mid-tone. OK, I'm going to add a little bit of my Neo McGilp but not too much. And I want a nice big pile of this. And so that green was already neutral, but if you look at it by itself on the palette, it's just a little bit too colorful for a nocturne. And so I wanted to gray it off even a little bit more. Now, this is going to be my base tone that I'm putting in. And so I put that up there. It looks a lot lighter down here because all the ambient light is hitting it. And so now I know that's too dark. I don't want that to be that dark for my mid-tone. So I'm going to come back in and lighten that. Yep, still very dark. I'm going to add a little bit of white to it. And I'm going to add just a little bit of ochre. And let's see what we have going on there. Yep, still too dark. OK, so we're going to lighten it up a touch more.
Okay. Now at this stage, I'm not going to add any cold wax. I might do that later. But at this point, I'm just adding a little bit of Neo McGill. Okay. Now this probably looks pretty dark. But let me show you how much darker we could go so that you just get a feeling for, feel for the value range of what a real dark is. So you see how dark that is? So probably looking at that, you thought, wow, that's a pretty dark mid-tone. And I am going towards the dark for a mid-tone, but I have a lot of reserve left. Okay, so here I am taking care of my shapes, and I want an interesting edge here where this is going to meet the sky. But my final edges will come in when I'm putting the sky in, and it will be, I'll take great care with my edges. Okay, so I'm using a big brush, and I'm putting this on not too terribly thickly, but enough to give coverage to the canvas. So this is why you mix up a big pool of paint. If you have to stop and remix, which I'm sure I'm going to have to do to cover all of this, it is takes up a lot more time than if you just are very generous on the front end and mix up a lot of this one tone. So there's my horizon, and I've got a nice straight line there so that when I come in, hopefully it's going to be straight. So I'm trying to make just interesting marsh designs here. And then, once this sets up a little bit, I will come back in and the design and continues the entire time. And what I will work with are my three values. So like I said, this is the mid value, which is the dominant value. The sky is going to be the lightest light. And there are going to be darks tucked back into this mid-tone. So it will be a three-value painting, hopefully. That is my intent. And you must have intent when you're painting. OK, so I'm going to put my little diva in here, which is going to be kind of this cute little tree that I've designed with inspiration, of course, from nature. OK, I think I want that just a little bit lower. So I'm going to just take that out. And I'm going to put it a little bit lower. And the reason I'm doing that is I have my little moon tucked in there. And I want it just a little bit closer 
to where the moon is going to be. So I'm going to lower it just about there. Okay, and that's going to be part of one tree. And then I have, just for a little bit of tension, I've got another little kind of nondescript tr tree that's off to the side there. And then I have another lacy designed tree mass. So I'm just trying to get all of my major shapes in. And the tree trunks, this little diva is really pretty much smack dab in the middle. And so I'm going to take care to design the trunk so that it's angled kind of across and give us, you know, we've got some kind of straight lines, horizontal lines. So this is going to be more of a slanted line to give us a little bit more variety of line. And this is going to have some very interesting lines in here, but the, uh, and we're going to have some sway to it. And uh, that's my initial attempt at something interesting, but it may change along the way as we come in with the sky color. I'm going to have some foliage coming off here, a little interest over here, but not too much interest. We're going to have most of our tree interest towards the center here, right where our diva is and right where our moon is going to be. Okay, so I think that's pretty good. I'm just going to cover a little bit more so that the toned canvas, and I have toned this with um, just a very, very light yellow ochre. It's just a little reflection of the marsh in there. Okay, so that's the end of the wash-in, and next we're going to come back and I'm going to show you how I'm going to pre-mix a lot of paint. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mix a dark value, but it will be very close to the mid value because this is a tonal painting, so we want the values very close together. And then in the mid-tone, you know, I've covered this all with basically one color. So I'm going to come back in and I'm going to mix a lot of different colors in here, but the same value. And I'll show you how I'm going to do that on my palette. And we'll mix the sky color and there will be a variety of uh, different shades from the top, which will be a little bit cooler, uh, down to close to the moon where it will warm up some. But again, all of those will be the same value, just a color shift. Okay, so now we're going to go into mixing of paint. And since I have my mid-tone on here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make some pools of paint that are warmer, cooler, redder, bluer for the mid-tones in here. And then I will leave that in a, a line, linear, so that I can look at them and make sure that they're all the same value. Then we'll go into mixing the darks, and lastly, we will mix our lights for the sky. Okay, so you can join me here on the palette. And this was my initial tone, and I'm going to mix up a bigger pool of that. And now I'm going to take some of that, and I'm going to put some of my cobalt in there and make it a cooler tone. 
but you can see next to it, it's the same, same value as this initial tone that we put in there. If you squint down, the edges between them go away. So now I'm going to make the same thing, but with a little bit warmer, redder towards the brown. And I'm going to do this by adding in my Venetian. And I'm going to neutralize that a little bit with my neutral darker green called Jasper. Okay, so now I have a little bit more yellow, I have a bluer, cooler, and I have a redder tone. So this top one here that is what I used initially, I'm going to change that up a little bit since that's already my base. And I'm going to make that a little bit more yellow, but obviously that's way too yellow because this does not feel like nighttime. So I'm going to cool it off a little bit with my cobalt. We've got three nice mid-tones, and I might continue while I'm painting to bend those also, but I've got three nice pulls to work from. So now I'm going to go ahead and mix up my darks, and I'm going to dip into my cobalt here. I'm going to try to make some nice big pulls so I don't have to remix them. Now, you see how colorful that is. I mean, that is like a, whoo, saturated. So I used my ruby red, and I used my cobalt. So now I'm going to come in here with my Venetian, which is a grade red, and probably even dip into my Jasper here to kind of calm that down a little bit. I'll put a little piece of that up here just so that you can see. It's still not calm enough, so you can see how colorful it is. Actually, it doesn't look too bad. You know what? I may just go with that because once I put that into this neutral mid-tone here, I think that's going to work well. It's this neutral mid-tone is going to, the, the dark is going to sink into that mid-tone and it will naturally uh, neutralize it even more. So, so that's my one tone. And I'm going to make one more darker tone that's more of like a uh, shade green color, kind of for the interior of the tree. Most of my darkest darks are really going to be in, in the bottom down here, where it's kind of the core, where it really doesn't get any light. And so this will be the shadow side of the tree. Now, I am going to try to keep my darks a little bit thinner. So probably what I will do is I'm going to add some wax, cold wax, to the mid-tones. And uh, our highlight, which is the moon, I will add some cold wax to that too. So I'm going to try this dark also and see how that works. Okay, I think that's a nice... Those are close enough in value that I think that will be a nice dark. You'll still know what's in light and what's in shadow, but it's not a huge jump. Okay, so we've got two darks. Now we're going to move on to our sky colors. Okay, so for the sky, again, it's going to be muted. So I'm going to start off first with cobalt. And I'm going to put some lemon yellow in there. And so now I've got a green. So now I'm going to neutralize it with, it's kind of a, it's a red, a purpley red, that ruby red. And see what I come up with here. So 
Add a bunch of white. And that is kind of a nice mauve tone, but not all that interesting. So I've added a little more of the ruby violet there. And now I'm going to bring in a little bit more of that green to kind of tone it down a bit. OK, so with that, that's a little bit more towards the red or the purple. And I'm going to have same value, but a bluer for the edges. OK, so two of those. And this green here, I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm going to put it down here as another mid-tone that I will actually lighten just a little bit so that it's the right value down here. OK, I'm going to clean my palette. And now I'm going to start mixing up the warmer tones that will be closer to the full moon. So I'm going to dip into my cobalt here and again my lemon yellow and add a bunch of white. So I think I'm going to keep one of those values that's a little bit cooler and really warm this one up. Might have warmed it up too much there. So there'll be a transition. Yeah, that's, I'm going to take that off because I would add a lot of white just to get that where I want to. Okay, I'm going to bring some of that in here to warm this up just a little bit. Okay. Okay, so we've got a cooler and a warmer, uh, cooler and a warmer. And now, last but not least, I'm going to mix up the color for the highlight. So I'm going to start with a bunch of white there and a little bit of lemon. And neutralize that just a little bit with some yellow ochre. Uh, it's a nice warm color. And I might have to adjust that when I get it up there, but that's what I'm going to start with. So now I'm going to put some wax into that so that our center of interest has a lot of texture. Hope you can appreciate what that wax just did. And I'm going to put some wax in the mid-tones. There's no magic to how much wax you put in. I mean, you can add, you can add a lot. Uh, it does decrease the pigment a little bit. Um, but it really does extend your colors. And OK, so you can see this is. These colors are very muted. And you know, if you were if you were wanting a colorful painting, this nocturne, tonalist nocturne, is not for you. But I like the color harmony associated with this and the subtle difference in value change. 
So that's what I'm going to be rooting for and trying to get in this painting. Hi, I'm Mary Garish and welcome to my workshop on tonalism. In this workshop, we're going to talk about the history of tonalism and I'm going to go through some master paintings and show you exactly what tonalism is. I'm also going to delve into the advantages of tonalism in using a limited palette and how that can help you in color mixing and controlling your values and have a painting that is close in value and very harmonious. I think they end up with a very strong design and it's all about design. So some people ask, what is a tonal painting and what goes into it? The early tonalists started with very much a monochromatic or a limited palette. And this led to paintings that were very moody, they were very poetic, and they were very close in value. It doesn't matter what genre of landscape painting that you're painting, whether it's mountains, oceans, marshes, the tonalist method is wonderful. You might ask, why use a limited palette? There are many reasons for this. Number one, if you're struggling with value or color, if you have a very limited palette, it's hard to get into trouble. Instead of thinking about how I'm gonna mix this color, it really becomes more about value. And what you will learn with this is using a limited palette, you really can mix pretty much all the colors that you need to for most landscapes. The perfect fit for this workshop really is anyone who's struggling with value and color. I think that's one of the hardest things to get our head around when we're painting, especially if you're a plain air painter. And if you limit your palette when you're outside, it makes it much easier and much less time consuming when you're trying to mix your colors. I don't know how many of you are familiar with cold wax. What it does is it makes it much easier to paint with texture. You take the cold wax and you add it to your paint and then you have at least doubled the amount of paint that you have. And it adds to the atmosphere in your paintings. So I would suggest that you join us today on this video and see how we do it. Hi, I'm Mary Garish and I'm a landscape painter from Florida. I live on Merritt Island, which is a barrier island near Cocoa Beach, and the north part of our island is where the Space Center is. I've lived in Florida pretty much my entire life, and because of that, I'm really drawn to painting the ocean and marshes and incredible skies. So I came to art as a second career. My first career, I was a physician. And I was very, very happy doing that until I discovered art. And then it was all about how I could find my way to paint full time because it was just so exhilarating every time you go to the canvas and the exploration that goes on there. So when I was growing up, I was never really exposed to art and really didn't find art until one day my daughter, who was about five, asked me, Mommy, can you draw me an animal? So I tried to draw a pig or a cow or whatever, and as children will, she says to me, why do all your animals look the same? And I'm like, well, because I can't draw. So I went and I ordered drawing on the right side of the brain and drawing with children. And when I started to read Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, I realized that it was really just geometry. And I always loved geometry. And so I started taking my first art class. And I started off with pastels. And I just did an art class three hours a week for many years. And then one day, I decided to take an, an intensive art workshop with Scott Christensen. And when I got there, I realized that I probably should not have been there because there were a lot of professional artists in that class. And I kind of just stayed in the back of the class. But what that workshop did for me is it made me realize I really wanted to pursue art as a second career. And I really envied all those people that were painting full time. 
At the end of that workshop, Scott asked everybody, where do you want to be in a week, a month, a year, five years with your art? And that was when I started to think, you know, I would really like to retire from medicine and start a second career as an artist. And it took me five years to get there, but then I finally retired and I'm a full-time art artist now and I'm just extremely grateful. You know, I never really had an aha moment with art, but it was a slow love affair where the more I studied art, the more I fell in love with it. Going to museums and galleries, going to workshops, and it's such an intellectual process. Every painting that you paint is totally different from the painting before, and it's an intellectual challenge each time that I love. So my art education consisted of going to lots of art workshops with teachers that I thought uh, I admired for their process and I wanted to paint in the same way they did, not like them, but in the same way, maybe towards a more representational painting. I studied with Matt Smith and Kwong Ho and C.W. Mundy and obviously Scott Christensen, who was my mentor. And last year I took a workshop on abstraction with Larry Moore, and I would highly recommend that. Uh, you don't have to want to paint abstractly, but that workshop will help you with your representational painting if that's the way you're painting. I think what I like about art the most is the exploration. And so recently, I have started to explore different palettes, very limited, simplified palettes. And I, I just do little studies, like maybe six by eights on, you know, on small little canvases, and just play around with color for color's sake. And that has been brought so much joy to me recently. And uh, I'm looking forward to exploring more in that capacity. Um, I, th I think if anybody asked me, I'd say what I'm known for the most are sky paintings. So back before I ever really started painting, when I was just still hobby painting, shall we say, I was enamored by the Florida skies. And our back patio faces west, and so frequently I would go out there and I was taking photographs. And my husband would laugh at me. He says, don't you have enough photographs of the sky? And I'm like, nope, everyone is unique and different. And so I think that was my love affair with skies. That's where it began. I think what I find most difficult about painting landscapes, especially outside, is the fact that you're so limited in time because you know the lighting conditions are constantly changing. And that, to me, is the biggest struggle. So what I have started doing, instead of going out to make a painting, I go out to study, and that might be just sketching in my sketchbook. It might be making an oil painting study and using a lot of photographs with that study and notes that I've made about the painting to go back into the studio and try to make a well-designed, successful studio painting. So now my career, uh, it's pretty well balanced, I would say. When I first started painting, my husband bought me all these business of art books, which of course I didn't want to read because I just wanted to paint. But I remember reading one of them and it was written by an artist. And the artist said that you should spend 30% of your time painting, 30% studying, and 30% marketing. And I was like, well, I just want to spend all my time painting. Well, and at first, until my career got going, you know, I didn't really need any marketing. But then I started getting into galleries and selling my art. And now I understand why they had that division. But I still try to spend less time marketing and much more time studying. I think now I study more than I'm at the easel, quote unquote, making a painting. I might be at the easel studying, but the making the painting has become a lesser portion of my time because I'm really trying to advance my painting. And I think study is extremely important. 
You know, I think everybody struggles with, should I be doing this? Am I good enough? Am I not good enough? And I've gotten past all of that. When I first started painting, I would apply to art shows and things like that. And I still certainly apply to art shows. But you know, you've got to be used to getting rejected if you're going to be an artist. And it's not really always about you or your painting. There may be thousands of paintings out there. I was actually president of the American Impressionist Society for a number of years. And so I had to do the jury process. And it is extremely difficult. So what I would say to you, yes, apply to shows, but you know, don't let that get you down. Don't let that get you discouraged. You know, go back to the easel. Every failure I have, I think I learn much more from than the paintings that are quote unquote successful. But you have to analyze why was that not successful? And that's where your greatest growth will come. I think what makes me different from a lot of other artists is that I don't let defeat get me down that much. I might spend a whole day in my studio making a painting and then wipe the thing off. And I'll get up the next day and I'm like, okay, back to the easel, what am I gonna paint? When I teach a workshop, I try to keep students engaged and interested in the process by demonstrating in short vignettes different things that they can take home with them and practice. I think making things simple and breaking them down is the easiest way to study. So there was a quote by Alexander Graham Bell that said, the only difference between success and failure is taking action. So take action with your paintings and your study process, and I'll bet you will grow by leaps and bounds. Hi, I'm Mary Garish, and welcome to my workshop on tonalism. In this workshop, we're gonna talk about the history of tonalism, and I'm gonna go through some master paintings and show you exactly what tonalism is. I'm also gonna delve into the advantages of tonalism in using a limited palette and how that can help you in color mixing and controlling your values and have a painting that is close in value and very harmonious. I think they end up with a very strong design and it's all about design. So some people ask, what is a tonal painting and what goes into it? The early tonalists started with very much a monochromatic or a limited palette. And this led to paintings that were very moody, they were very poetic, and they were very close in value. It doesn't matter what genre of landscape painting that you're painting, whether it's mountains, oceans, marshes, the tonalist method is wonderful. You might ask, why use a limited palette? There are many reasons for this. Number one, if you're struggling with value or color, if you have a very limited palette, it's hard to get into trouble. Instead of thinking about how I'm gonna mix this color, it really becomes more about value. And what you will learn with this is using a limited palette, you really can mix pretty much all the colors that you need to for most landscapes. The perfect fit for this workshop really is anyone who's struggling with value and color. I think that's one of the hardest things to get our head around when we're painting, especially if you're a plain air painter. And if you limit your palette when you're outside, it makes it much easier and much less time consuming when you're trying to mix your colors. I don't know how many of you are familiar with cold wax. What it does is it makes it much easier to paint with texture. You take the cold wax and you add it to your paint and then you have at least doubled the amount of paint that you have. And it adds to the atmosphere in your paintings. So I would suggest that you join us today on this video and see how we do it.